Okay, so we're gonna come back to talking about dissolved gases. Both carbon dioxide and oxygen dissolve into water depending on partial pressures and temperatures. Um, groundwater tends to have high dissolved CO2 and low dissolved oxygen, partly because of a lot of root and microbial respiration in soils. In turbulent streams, both are, tend to be maintained at or near saturation. And when oxygen is present, redox values are high and you have an oxidizing environment. Metabolic activities, diffusion, temperature, and proximity to the atmosphere can all influence dissolved oxygen concentrations. And sometimes it's measured in milligrams per liter, and sometimes it's measured as a percent saturation. Percent saturation is the concentration of oxygen relative to the maximum equilibrium concentration for that solution. So here we talk about different oxygen requirements. There is more dissolved oxygen in colder water, can hold more. Both fish and insects tend to breathe dissolved oxygen. Some breathe um, atmospheric oxygen as well. Aquatic plants use oxygen and algae uses oxygen to respire just like we do. They breathe in oxygen and breathe out CO2, just like respiration. Um, and then wind and plants through photosynthesis can both introduce oxygen into the water through photosynthesis. Oxygen and water can exceed 100% saturation. It can either stay dissolved in the supersaturated state or it can form bubbles. Um, and it tend to, salmon tend to prefer dissolved oxygen concentrations of greater than 11 milligrams per liter. So you can see the different tolerance values for different fish species on the right. An oxic or an aerobic environment has plentiful oxygen. An anaerobic or an anoxic environment has no oxygen. So those terms are all synony or synonyms. This is an interesting figure from the book, and it shows you how dissolved oxygen increases with, inc with uh, actually decreases with increasing altitude, so um, elevation, and how it, <laughs> how it increases with lower temperatures. This whole figure just is confusing. I think the colors feel backwards, and the fact that the, the Axes are sometimes backwards. It's just you might have to sit and think about this one a little bit, but it works out. It's not wrong. It's just confusing. Okay. Many lakes show seasonal patterns in a lot of these different factors. So in temperature, in oxygen, in redox potential, and in total iron. Um, so the panels at right show changes through time on the x-axis and depth on the y-axis, and you can see how in the summertime, the you know, water warms up mainly near the surface. Um, you can see changes in oxygen concentrations, um, mostly getting higher in the surface water. Um, you can see redox potentials, and you can see total iron. And the iron, um, sometimes, you know, as redox potentials increase, then things like iron oxidation can take place. So I talked about photosynthesis being one of these factors that, are, that goes against redox potential. So light, temperature, and nutrients all control photosynthetic rates. Um, the story is about carbon, carbon fixation, but it's often easier in aquatic systems to measure oxygen production because that's correlated with photosynthesis. So photosynthesis contributes oxygen to aquatic ecosystems, and then we measure that oxygen. Things like clouds, vegetation, waves on the surface of the water can all decrease light availability and decrease photosynthesis. And organisms can alter their physiology. They can acclimate to different conditions to maximize photosynthesis. Some algae can synthesize carotenoids, or red pigments, to protect themselves from high light. And then those algae, if they're eaten by zooplankton um, and then by fish, can give color, those pink and red colors, to things like salmon, flesh, and flamingos. So these are just some figures that show the, the um, photosynthesis irradiance diagrams. So they show the effects of light on photosynthesis rate. So in general, the photosynthetic rate increases as light increases. Okay, so that's why it's going up. But then it shows um, Pmax, so maximum photosynthesis rate. So after the peak, more light can actually cause photoinhibition and photosynthesis will go down. The gross compensation point um, or the compensation point is when gross production is equal to respiration. And alpha is the initial slope. So how quickly can these systems ramp up 
So low light adapted species can sometimes ramp up their photosynthesis much faster than high light adapted species. All right, the rate of photosynthesis tends to double with each 10 degree increase in temperature. This is called a Q10. Um, and the other thing that can increase photosynthesis is water velocity. So water velocity can decrease the boundary layer along the surface of rocks, increasing diffusion of those gases, oxygen and carbon dioxide to the algae surface and increase photosynthesis. Things like um, herbicides like atrazine, if you remember um, back to um, Tyrone Hayes's frogs, can interfere with photosystem too, and so can decrease photosynthesis. Respiration, this is the approximate formula for respiration. It's kind of like the opposite of photosynthesis. Different organisms can use different carbon substrates for respiration, lipids, sugars, methane, et cetera. But respiration contributes CO2 to, to aquatic ecosystems and all things respire, even plants and algae. In fact, sometimes algal respiration during an especially large algal bloom can use up all the oxygen in the water, all the dissolved water, and cause the fish to die. So this is a picture of a fish kill in Florida. So stream metabolism and productivity. Um, we measure gross primary productivity, which is the total carbon fixed in a system. The net primary productivity is that total carbon fixed minus the metabolic demands of the plant. So the respiration of the autotrophs. And then net ecosystem productivity is the total carbon fixed minus all carbon loss to all respiration. And that's respiration of the autotrophs and the heterotrophs, or it's called ecosystem respiration. So we can talk about GPP, NPP, or NEP. Okay, so real fast, we can talk about lakes. Um, we can talk about limnology. We're not dealing with lakes much in this program, but um, lake water varies by depth and seasonal mixing can happen. So this is a picture showing Thermal stratification, where it gets warm in the summer at the top, but it stays cool in the bottom. And this, this graph of temperature shows the thermocline, a, a rapid change in temperature. Now, um, the thermocline can get set up in the summer, um, and it can get set up in the winter when there's ice on top. But in the spring and the fall, the thermocline disappears and lakes go through what's called a mixing period. Some lakes mix twice a year in the spring and the fall. Some lakes that don't ice over in the winter only mix once, basically in the kind of like fall, winter, spring, and then they set up a thermocline in the summer, and some lakes don't mix at all. So here's some clines in lakes. The thermocline shown with um, temperature in the dotted line, the chemocline shown with oxygen. Um, there are other chemoclines that you can measure. Um, the hypolimnion, which is the bottom layer, can turn anoxic in lakes, lots, of, no, not much oxygen. Um, and we can see similar patterns in the sediment in stream bottoms. And so the top panel is showing the patterns in a lake going down and the bottom, like over many, many meters. And the bottom panel is showing you the depth in the sediment, just like a few millimeters. And this, you can see the same kind of thermocline or chemocline in the sediment. Here's some pictures of some meromictic lakes, meaning lakes that never mix. Um, they are also called amictic. And what can happen is they can set up these really extreme chemoclines where you have these pools of fossil water at the bottom that never mix with the rest of the water, like in Soap Lake in Washington. Some really strange chemoclines out there. Um, and there are bacteria that live on these chemocline gradients um, doing things like sulfur reduction and, um, and things like that. We have several of these um, Meramictic lakes in Eastern Washington. Um, lake Tanganyika is one of the biggest lakes in the world in Africa. It's a rift lake and it's really, really deep and it doesn't mix completely. And then Pink Lake in Australia is another example. All right, so how do organisms deal with anoxic conditions? Um, wetland plants have some really cool adaptations. These water lilies can uptake oxygen into new leaves, transport it down to the roots, and then send it up into older leaves. Okay, so they can really move oxygen around. They can also oxidize the rhizosphere. And if you dig into a pond, you might find deposits of iron oxide, rust, right, found around the rooting zone because of these leaky roots that are leaking oxygen. Another adaptation is arenchyma. These are air channels and roots that allow for the passage of gases easily among locations. Um, lacunae are also words for air spaces. 
They allow the transport of oxygen down, but they also allow the transport of methane up. And so there's both passive and pressurized transport of these gases in these um, macrophytes. And the last thing is if your roots are always underwater, you might need to get them above water to um, breathe. And so mangroves send up nematophores and cypress send up these things called knees. And they both get their roots up above the surface of the water to allow them to respire. Some plants can respire anaerobically through anoxic periods by producing ethanol, things like peltandra and typha. And these dead plant stalks can, um, they can use them to transport oxygen. It's called venturi flow. So even after they're dead, they can still help to support the rest of the plant um, community. And some of these plants can take up bicarbonate instead of dissolved CO2 if dissolved CO2 becomes too rare. There are some other adaptations to anoxia in animals. Some fish can gulp air when dissolved oxygen levels are low, like this air, this air gulping gar. Some fish can get up and go between pools, so like this walking catfish. And things like lungfish can curl up and wait in these nests um, in the sediment that they coat with mucus um, until conditions are better for them. And then there are things like respiratory tubes and in insects and air bubbles. Okay, we'll take a break. <laughs>